All right, let's, let, let's dive into this. We're going to look at a story today in the book of John, John chapter 6. And it's a story, if you grew up at church, if you visited church on Christmas or Easter, you even went once or twice a year, you have probably heard some version of this story. Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting story. It shows up in all four of the Gospels, but I really like John's account that we're going to look at today and how he addresses it. Because the book of John, if you guys have already established in this series, um, John has an agenda, and he's real clear about what the agenda is. And the agenda is he wants you to see Jesus for who he really is. And what we learn about John that I think is so interesting is John did not begin to follow Jesus uh, with faith. John followed Jesus because of what he saw and because of what he heard. And he's real clear about that. Right? He's real clear about that. He saw what Jesus you know, did. He heard what Jesus said. And eventually, at some point in his life, he chose to believe that this Jesus was actually the Messiah. And that's when he put his faith in Jesus as his Messiah. But it started by just observing. It started by looking at these signs, looking at these miracles, listening to Jesus' teaching. And then he kind of puts all this together. And he says, I'm going to give you the same opportunity that I had. And so he walks through and he lists these different signs and these different wonders, but there's an agenda attached to it. He's wanting us to look beneath it and begin to see Jesus for what he really is. And he organizes his account, which we call the Gospel of John, into these events. And he makes it real clear, hey, you need to know that this was not Jesus just doing random acts of kindness. Right? There's a lot more going on to this. And his ultimate point is John doesn't just want us to see what Jesus did, but to know who Jesus is. Right? So we're going to look today at what Jesus did. But that's not really what this is all about. What this is about and what I know John's original intention was and certainly my intention today as we kind of look at the story together is not that you just see what Jesus did, but that you actually know who Jesus is. Because once you know who Jesus is, that can reframe your entire life life. Right? So let's go ahead. We'll begin. John chapter 6 says, Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs that he had performed by healing the sick. So again, John wasn't alone. There's other people who are seeing Jesus do these signs, do these wonders, and he's building up, right, this community, this group of people who are like, what's he going to do next? Let's just see, right? So then Jesus went up on a mountainside and he sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and he saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? So this whole account really starts with this question, and this whole story centers around or revolves around this question that Jesus is asking to the disciples, which is where shall we buy bread for these people who uh, need to eat? He asked this only to test them, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. It's the like not fun part about being friends with Jesus is like when he asks you a question, it's not because he needed the answer, right? He already knew the answer, right? So this is kind of a setup. It says, Philip answered him, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one of us to have a bite. So Philip takes the question and he analyzes it. He's the analyzer, right? He's going to pull out his calculator, start doing some numbers. He's like, that's a lot of bread. And it would take a half a year's salary just to buy enough bread for every person here just to have a single bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew Simon, Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place. And they sat down. About 5,000 men were there, which tells us there's about 20,000 people total. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. All right, raise your hand if you've ever heard this story before. Yeah, that, that's a, a little bit of the disadvantage we have kind of going into this because most of you probably heard, like I did, a Sunday school version of this story about this little boy who had a little lunch in his paper bag and they found him and he had two fish and five loaves and Jesus took it and he did this kind of, you know, amazing miracle, which happened. But there's a lot more to the story. And there's a couple key players in here. There's two disciples that are mentioned by name. We have Philip, right? And Philip, again, he's the analyzer. He's the number cruncher. 
He's a detailed person, right? Isn't it true, like in almost every marriage, there is that one person that's kind of the analyzer, right? The one who pays the bills, who keeps things moving, keeps things going in the right direction. They tend to be the more annoying person in the relationship, but, but you need them. You need them, right? They, 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 they have a purpose in the way that they analyze and kind of hold everything together, right? And then there's Andrew. And Andrew's the action guy, right? So while Philip is crunching numbers, Andrew's like, I'm going to solve this. I'm going to figure it out. And he just starts going around confiscating little kids' lunch boxes, right? And so he finds a kid actually had a little something, two fish and five lousy pieces of bread. So they're both trying to solve the problem in two completely different ways, but they both come to the exact same solution, which was this. There is no solution. <laughs> there is no answer. There, 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 this isn't possible. We got 20,000 people here who need to eat, and we have two fish, and we have five pieces of bread. But this was kind of a test, right? Because again, as the passage that we just read stated, Jesus already knew what he was going to do. So when he says to them, where should we buy the bread for all these people to eat, right? The answer to that question is the one that's asking the question, right? That's the the answer to this question is coming, right, from the one who asked the question. He's really the only one who can solve this. He's the only one who can fix this out. And for some reason, you got Philip, you got Andrew. They've seen Jesus, by the way. This is not Jesus' first miracle, right? In fact, Scripture tells us that they just came from a region where Jesus had been doing many signs and wonders. So they've already seen his power. They've seen what he's capable of. But for some reason, in this scenario, when there's a problem and seemingly no solution, they don't turn to God in the flesh. They're trying to figure this out on their own. They know he can do it. They know he has the power to do it, but they don't turn to him. I think it's interesting because I think that's where a whole lot of us are at, right? Right? You know the power of God. If you and I sat down over a cup of coffee and we just talked about your life, I bet I could, with just a handful of questions, start to help you connect some dots in your past where you've seen God work in some miraculous ways. I often tell people that you got to remember God's faithfulness in your past or you'll never trust him with your future. Right. And so there 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 are moments, there's times, there's seasons where you've seen God act in miraculous ways in your life, in your marriage, maybe with your kids or your finances or your health. You've seen that. But every new problem that we have, for some reason, there's something about us as human beings. Right. where We want to be self-reliant and we want to figure it out on our own. That's what's going on in this story. What they uh, man, I messed that up. Okay, they are more focused on what they can't do than what Jesus can do. And that's where some of you are right now, right? You're more focused on what you can't do than what it is that God can do in your life. And he's right there and he's able and he's willing. But some of you are struggling with that because you want to figure it out. You want to try to manipulate and control the things in your life that you can't manipulate and control. And one time Jesus said, listen, apart from me, you can do nothing. But we still trying to figure it out on our own. One time God says, not by my might, nor by power, but by my spirit. But we're like, I don't know. I think I can do this. I think I can handle this. I think I can handle this. But the reality is in your life right now, there is a mess. And that's good news to some degree because miracles always start with a mess. Miracles always start with a mess. So some of you came in here today and you're like, whoa, whoa, my life is, is a disaster. I'm like at the end of the rope. I've like lost hope. And you need to know that you're actually in a pretty good place because you're in the first stage of a miracle. Miracles always begin with a mess. They always start with a problem that can't be solved. And so for some of you right now, you're looking at your finances and you're like, I'm crunching the numbers. This doesn't work. We don't have enough money. We're not going to be able to pay the bills. What are we going to do? We're going to keep going into debt. Right? If I don't get that new job, or if I don't get that promotion, or if I don't get that new client, like we are done. For some of you, uh, it's an addiction. And maybe you've battled with this thing since you were a teenager. I don't know what it is, but you got this thing that you just keep going back to, thinking somehow there's going to be a payoff, somehow it's going to help you out, somehow it's going to help you survive, and it doesn't. It's just wrecking your life. And you've tried to stop before. You've done certain things. And you're like, why why even give it a shot now? Like I've tried to stop so many times before and I just don't have the power to do it. Maybe for you, it's your marriage. 
And you're like, there's not enough marriage therapists in the state of Florida to fix our marriage, right? It's that bad. We have no hope. For some of you, you wish your problem was a marriage problem because you're single. And one of your biggest dreams is just to get married, but it's not working out for you right now. And you've gotten to a place in your life where you're actually tempted to get married to someone that you know is not God's will for your life, but you're trying to fix the problem on your own. Maybe it's some kind of chronic pain that you have. Maybe it has something to do with your kids and you've tried everything, but they're just not where they need to be and they're not coming back to the Lord. Maybe it's a divorce that has just wrecked you. And it's hard for you to even get out of bed in the morning. Miracles always start with a mess, with some problem that I can't solve. But we'll try, right? And like Philip, we'll do the math. Like Andrew, we'll try to strategize. We'll try to figure out a way to make all this work, but it's not working out for you. And it doesn't feel like there's a lot of options, right? It feels hopeless. And what we're missing is the same thing that the disciples were missing, which was adding Jesus into the equation. The answer is actually in the question. Now, I've already read the question that Jesus asked. I've already read it twice, but I think most of us probably missed it. But the answer is actually in the question. What was the question that Jesus asked? He said, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He says, where should, and here's the word, we. Where should we? That's what he said. He said we. He never said me. He never said, Philip, I need you to go and to figure out all this stuff on your own. He says, no, where are we, right? It's a, it's a we problem, not a me problem. And you have to get that. You have to understand that because some of you are trying to figure this out on your own. And you were never, ever, ever designed to do that. That's why Jesus said, if I'm in you and you in me, you remain in me, you're gonna bear much fruit. But apart from me, you're gonna do nothing. Right? There was never this intention that somehow you were going to figure out all this on your own. So if you want a miracle, we need to turn our me problems into we problems. People ask me all the time, when do I know that I'm ready, Pete? Like, when do I know that I'm ready to step out in faith? When do I know that I'm ready to really trust Jesus with my life or to trust Jesus with this problem or this solution? And, and the honest truth is we're never going to feel ready. You're never going to feel ready for the most difficult, challenging moments of your life. You're never going to feel ready, right? It's, it's, it's why they call it faith. You step out. You trust him with it. You trust him with your situation. You trust him with the, with the moment, the circumstance in your life where you desperately need a miracle. And you understand it's not a me problem. It's a we problem. Jesus never asked you to go alone. Several years ago, uh, I jumped out of a plane and... Um, like that was the goal, it was the purpose. It wasn't like an accident. Like we were up there and we were going to do this, to jump out of a plane. And I, actually, that's kind of a lie. I didn't actually jump out of a plane. I was attached to a dude who jumped out of a plane, right? <laughs> he did the jump. If, it, if left to my own device, just me in the parachute, no way I'm getting out of that plane. Like it's a perfectly good plane. I'm not jumping, but I happened to be attached to that dude. And so when he sat down on the edge of the seat, which means by the way, that I'm the one dangling out of the plane at that moment. And when he fell out of the plane, I had no choice because I was attached to him. And we just fell out of the plane together, right? It was tandem. That's what they call that, right? And what you have to understand is in whatever situation that you're facing, that seems so dire. You're not going alone. This isn't a me problem. This is a we problem problem. God's saying, bring me in, right? Get me involved. Invite me. Let's make this a we problem. Everything changes when we get Jesus. So you got Philip who's trying to solve the problem. You have Andrew trying to solve the problem. And no matter how they looked at it, no matter what they tried, what they came up with is math that didn't add up, right? They've got five loaves plus two fish plus 20,000 people equals not enough. No matter how you look at it, no matter how you divide it up, right, it's not enough. And they need new math. We have new math, by the way. You know, you know this in schools? I, I didn't know this until my kids came home one day with, like, homework. And they're like, Dad, can you help me? I'm like, you're in second grade. Of course I can help you. I got this. And we're doing the math, and it's not working for me because now they're doing new math. And I don't know why we have new math because the old math seemed perfectly good, don't you think? 
Were, were you getting like incorrect change or something at the store? No, our, our, our old math was great math. It worked perfectly well. I don't think that we really need the new math, but now I can't help my second grade. And I think that's why educators do it. I think they come up with this stuff to make his parents look like idiots. <laughs> that's what they're doing, right? And so that's literally, my son's looking at me like, dad, you can't do second grade math? Like he's literally looking at me like I'm an idiot. And, and I'm like, oh, yes, I know I'm an idiot. I was just hoping that you would be older than seven before you figured that out, son, right? Like, but we need new math because this doesn't work. But what's interesting is you take five loaves plus two fish plus 20,000 plus Jesus, and all of a sudden it equals more than enough. It equals more than enough, right? Plus Jesus. And that's why when you add Jesus into the equation, all of a sudden you're not enough becomes more than enough. See, some of you think that your situation is dire and you think that you've run out of all your resources and you've run out of all your ideas and all that stuff, right? But when you come to the end of yourself, if you'll just invite Jesus in that equation, you're not enough will become more than enough. But you got to trust him with it, right? You got to trust him with it. You add Jesus into the equation and everything changes. Right? You, you, you take your, you're not enough. You take whatever it is that you have that's not enough. Take whatever you have that's not sufficient, right? That can't fix your problem. It's not enough to solve your situation. You take that and you add that to Jesus, and all of a sudden, you're not enough becomes more than enough. That's how miracles start. So, whatever you're facing right now, whatever it is you're going through right now, you need to know that anything plus Jesus equals enough. Your hurt plus Jesus can equal healing. Your addiction plus Jesus can equal freedom. Your broken marriage plus Jesus can equal hope. Your lack, whatever it is that you lack, your lack plus Jesus can equal enough. It can be sufficient. Right? But there's something interesting here in this story that I, I, I'm sure maybe at one point I was aware of this, but I have totally forgotten this. And Pastor Mark has this unbelievable gift of giving me passages that I've never preached on before. I think he does that kind of as a challenge. Uh, and I'm so glad that he did because it forced me to really kind of get into the story and not just pull something off the shelf and kind of dust it off, uh, but to really get in the story and kind of look at some of the nuances here. And one of the things that I found really interesting kind of rereading through this story is that Jesus waits for them to give him the five loaves and the two fish. And he doesn't need the five loaves and the two fish to do this miracle, does he? No, not at all. It's, it's almost like just a prop, right? He doesn't need it. If he wants to, he could like just start turning stones into bread, right? Just like popcorn, boop, 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 boop. He could turn a tree into a pile of fish. He could do whatever he wants, right? But he waits for them to bring him the two fish and the five loaves. And there's a reason behind that, because at the end of the day, this isn't just about what Jesus wants to do for us. It's about what he wants to do in us. You'll see that a lot in these miracles that you guys are looking at in the book of John. That There's a human element a participation, whether it's servants going and filling up really heavy jars of water and bringing them back to, to be made. There's a human participant. It's like there's these little steps of obedience. And we see this all the way through Scripture, not just in the book of John, but Big miraculous moves of God are almost always preceded by small steps of obedience, almost every single time, right? And this is one of them. He wants to see, will you trust me with what you have? You bring me what you have, even though it's not enough, and trust me that I can do something with that. That's really the key to this whole miracle. It starts with something, not enough, but it starts with something. Not much, but it's something. And I believe that part of what Jesus was trying to communicate to all of us is listen, you just trust me with whatever you have. It may not be much. It's not enough. It's not sufficient. But whatever it is that you have, just trust me with it. And you'll see that you're not enough can be more than enough. They had two fish. They had five loaves. It didn't feel like much, but it was something. And he took what little bit that they trusted him with and he made it enough. Now, this part of the equation, our participation, us bringing whatever it is we have, even though it's not enough. It, it feels silly sometimes, doesn't it? I mean, don't you sometimes convince yourself, you look at what you have, uh, we could even use like uh, generosity with the church, right? I'm sure a lot of you have been obedient and you try to give back 10% of what you make, 
right? Honor God with that 10%. But sometimes you're looking at that 10% and you're like, ah, that's, that's not much. I mean, what could God do with that? Right? We're in a big church. There's a lot of people. But this, I mean, is this really going to matter? It absolutely matters. It matters more than you could ever imagine because God can take that not enough and make it more than enough. And he does that. He can take that little bit that you give and it can impact a soul for eternity. I mean, how amazing is that? You talk about taking not enough and making it more than enough. That's a miracle in and of itself. So what is it that you have right now in your life that you need to trust God with? Give it to him and watch your not enough become more than enough. Right? It's possible. Because I think there's some of you that are here today that you didn't come here just because you needed to hear a message about miracles. You came here because you needed a miracle. If you find yourself right now in a situation, and it might be a relational thing, a financial thing, a vocational thing, a health thing. I don't know what it is. But you find yourself in your life right now where there's a problem and you have not been able to find a solution to it. In fact, if if that's you, if you're here today and you find yourself in some kind of situation or circumstance that feels like it's absolutely out of your control and you need God's divine power to show up in your life, if there's ever going to be a resolution to this problem, would you be so brave just to raise your hand right now if that's you? You need a miracle in your life? Yeah. There's lots of us, right? There's a lot of us that are desperate to see God move, for God to work. And what he's asking of you right now is, will you trust me? Will you trust me with it all? And so I don't know what it is you need to trust him with. I don't know what part of your relationship it is. I don't know what part of your addiction that might be. I don't know what part of your finances that might be. But I know right now that God is calling some of you to say, just trust me. Just put it in my hands. Take that little thread of hope that you're holding on to by your finger and give that to me because I'll take your not enough and I'll make it more than enough. Now, there's a second part of the story that I want to look at real quick as we close because it's the interesting dynamic that happens. So Jesus does this miracle. He feeds the 20,000 people. He leaves and 24 hours later, a good part of this crowd is still following him, right? He gave them you know, one heck of a food truck experience and they want more, right? And so they're following him and they kind of confront him. And this is the dialogue. 24 hours later, after he does this miracle, this is what happens. It says, Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, you are not looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and you had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the son of man will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, what must we do uh, to do the works God requires? Right? What must we do to do the work that God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. That's simple, right? It's not making this complicated. You want to know what it is? He says, this is it. This is your only job right here. You need to believe in the one he has sent. You need to believe in me, Jesus. So they asked him, what sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? Now, isn't that interesting? They want another sign. They want another meal. They're like, where's that food truck at? That was so amazing. You see what I'm saying here? They just 24 hours earlier had seen the sign. But now they need another one. They need something else. Is there anything more impressive? He says, what will you do? said, our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from the heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. That's the invitation right there. He says, I'm the bread of life. I'm the bread of life. And anyone who comes to me, right, will never be hungry. He's saying, I'm the answer. See, the question is not, what do you and I get out of this whole Christian thing? Right? Sometimes we make it about that. The question is not, what do you and I get out of this? The question is not, what do you and I get out of the church or what do you and I get out of worship? That's the wrong question, right? The question that really 
matters. The question of first importance, the question that I think can change everything for you, no matter how old you are or how long you've been in church or whatever, the question that Jesus was always trying to get them to focus on is who do you believe that I am? He says, whoever comes to me will never go hungry. This is no small thing that he's inviting us into. See, the real miracle in this whole story wasn't that they found out that there was enough food to feed 20,000 people. The real miracle in the story wasn't uh, when they found out that there was going to be enough and even some extra. The real miracle in the story is when they found out what they already had. The real miracle in the story is when they found out who he was, that he was the bread of life, that he was the bread of life. And if they came to him, that they would never go hungry. See, that's the real miracle, right? And that's what John is trying to drive to all through this. He's like, let me, let me show you how God can and will provide for you in your life. But more important than that, the greatest miracle, the most amazing thing that could ever happen is you discover who he is, that he is the bread of life, that he is the individual that can take away your sins, that he can give you the grace and the mercy that you so need. Because when you discover that he's enough, that he is your bread, that he is your strength, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, that he is the resurrection, right? That he's everything. And that if he never gives you one more thing, 